big question that I that people often get hooked up on is really how much should I fund it? So how much should I fund a policy? Right? And let's say let's say this is your first exposure to the infinite banking concept, to high cash value life insurance, what I wanna do is share with you all of the options that exist in the marketplace. Whether you agree with it or disagree, it's good to know that, okay, here are the list of the options, and then I can do my research on my own time and navigate, eventually boil down to a, a specific product and then I go find an agent that can help me. And then I try to, you know, find a company, you know, an insurance company that I would like to work with, or maybe the agent can recommend, and I can do additional research and come to a conclusion. Yes? So let me first share with you the different options in regards to this is a marketing term, infinite banking. When we say infinite banking, or cash value, or cash, yeah, cash flow banking, or become your own banker, tax-free banking, what become your own banker. Those are all marketing terms. These are the actual uh, product names. These are the actual product names that you could type in and companies would, would pop up. But if you type in infinite banking, people will pop up right? Articles will pop up. Reviews will pop up. It's, it's not an actual product. This is a concept. It's a concept. Here's the actual product that is tied to the concept. All right? So the actual products, whole life, index universal life, premium financing, investment grade insurance contract, IGIC, investment grade insurance contract, ILIT, Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust, okay? Irrevocable Life Insurance Trust. All of these life insurance products right here are permanent policies. You'll have them for your whole entire life. When you pass away, the, the policy will terminate death benefit gets paid out to the heirs or the trust of the family and then the funds get dispersed according to how you wanted it to be okay so whichever product you're looking at no matter what you got to know this your four major numbers so that you can come from a, an understanding that okay when i allocate this percentage of funds to this product, I know how I'm going to uh, then use those dollars once I've established this particular account. So something that people get hooked up on a lot is right here, how much should I fund it? So they do all, you know, you typically do all the research in learning the product and learning the concept, but not a whole lot of people talk about how much should I fund the policy. So for me, the way I did it for myself is I take my net positive, okay? We're gonna write this out so it's crystal clear. Net positive monthly conservative cash flow. Net positive monthly conservative cash flow. Whatever that number is, let's say it's a thousand bucks. Thousand bucks times it by 12. That's 12,000 a year. I then take that number and I will times it by 66%. Okay, times 66%, and that's 
$920. Divide that by 12. That's 660 bucks a month. So, conservatively, with my eyes closed, if I had a thousand bucks a month, let's say I got no debt, I have a thousand bucks a month, I have no debt, with my eyes closed, I could fund a policy either $660 a month or $7,920 a year. Consistently, conservatively, with my eyes closed. This is a conservative approach. The aggressive approach would be taking all your cash flow and dumping it into this type of account, okay? But now here's the thing that you have to think about. If I'm an individual that has only $1,000 a month in cash flow and I have zero debt or maybe I have debt, you need to ask yourself, is the 660 or the 1000 a month, putting it into this concept, this idea, is that the best use of my dollars according to where you are at financially? So, in my opinion, because this is my opinion, at the end of the day, you're free to do whatever you want. But if I was in this position where maybe I'm only making 4,500 a month, my expenses are 35, I got zero debt, and I'm only cash flowing a thousand bucks at the end of the month, me personally, I would not start a policy right away, right? My objective would be how do I take that 10 grand, I mean, how do I take that 1,000 and turn it into 10,000, right? So essentially, how do I 10x? First, because the, out of all these strategies right here, there is no, there is no way I'm, I'm 10xing my dollars over here. What you need to understand is this product, all of these products are long-term products. So it's long-term growth, right? It's safe for the most part. These products are for the most part safe, uh, long-term growth. So if I only have a thousand bucks a month, I make 4,500, I spend 35. You want to really ask yourself before I, I look at this, is there a way I can take that thousand and turn it into 10? Or better yet, is there a way I can move the comma one over and add a zero? Is there a way I can go from 4,500 a month to 45,000 a month? so that I can have more conservative monthly cash flow to work with and then dump a good amount of money over here into this safe place, okay? Another way that I will figure out how much an individual that wants to fund a policy is I'm going to look at what you're already doing in your finances. Are you saving? Right? Are you saving consistently? Are you giving consistently? Are you investing consistently? <clears throat> right? Are you saving? Are you giving? Are you investing? What is it? Is it is it like a 10%? 10%? 10%? Is that how you roll? Is it 10, 20, 15? What is it, right? So I try to see what are you already doing. And essentially, I could take the saving and the giving and probably even the investing dollars, add them up all together, and come up with a solid funding amount. Because 
one could say, all right, uh, if, I, uh, if I got 30% of my monthly income, that's free cash flow. And prior to coming across this concept, this idea, I was saving 10%, I was giving 10%, and I was investing 10% each and every month. Well, I could take the 30 as a whole, max fund a policy, and redirect where you save and how you give, right? Just redirect it to the policy, and then essentially you'd be borrowing the 10% out to invest, and then throughout the year, you're pulling roughly 10% out to give, right? So depending on what that number actually is and what it boils down to, how much cash do I start out with, right? We'll determine if that makes sense. But really at the end of the day, we're looking at this. Cash flow is the most important thing. And I'm also looking at your capital. Do you already have a certain amount of savings already built up? Do you, do you have a certain amount of investment already built up? Oh, maybe there is an investment that you no longer want to invest in. Let's say it's a 401k. Let's say you finally come to the conclusion that 401ks are terrible. You hate them. They've been charging you ridiculous interest rates, uh, fees. You found out you're going to pay higher taxes when you take withdrawals out when you're older. You found out that the, the fees are calculated annually. So that means that every single year, whether it's a 1% fee, a 2% fee, or 3% fee, that number doubles every single year for the most part because it charges you on an annual basis on all of the money that's in there, not just the principal dollars. It charges you on the growth and all. Even if the money goes down, even if you lose money, you still get charged the same annual fee on all the money. So even if you lost money, you still got to pay a fee for losing money that year. That kind of sucks. So if you came to that conclusion, you're like, oh man, you know, I don't like this no more. And maybe you were allocating a thousand a month. So that's say 12 grand, right? And then you were allocating 600 a month to your savings account, which was earning you 0%. So you weren't earning anything anyways. So let's say that's 7,200. And then you give the same amount. You give 7,200 a year or something like that. So now 7,200 plus 7,200 plus 12,000, you're all the way at 26,400. And that's not including any additional capital or cash flow, right? Savings is not cash flow. Saving is an expense. Giving is an expense. Investing is an, is an expense. So if you're saving a thousand bucks, you're giving a thousand bucks, you're investing a thousand bucks, you cannot add that to your cash flow. So you'd have to minus that, you have to record that as an expense then what's left over, free cash flow, money that doesn't go anywhere, maybe that number is 800 bucks. So if it's 800, that's 12, so that's 96, right? You see how we can get higher and higher in terms of like what we could fund and then in no time, maybe we're in 30K a year, maybe we're 50K, maybe 100, maybe a quarter million, maybe a half a million, maybe a million. Really, you can go as high as you want in terms of funding, you can go as high as you want according to your age, health, and finances, right? So what you can't do is if you only make 4,500 a month, you can't say, oh, I wanna put in 100 grand a year into a policy. They won't let you do that. It has to be proportionate to what you bring in, what your income is, you know, and then your age and health will also determine how much death benefit 
they're willing to give you. Okay? So that is uh, one of the biggest, biggest uh, questions that I often get. People get tangled up with that, and I try to simplify it as much as possible. It really just boils down to your monthly cash flow, your existing capital that you do have, right? And then your comfort level, right? Because you might say in your head, well, okay, if I put 30 grand over here and, and the money is, you know, for long-term safe growth, well, maybe I have an opportunity to put this 30 grand in a real estate investment deal where within six to nine months I could flip my money and make 10 grand on the 30. You're not going to make 10 grand in any one of these products in the first year. No way. Every single product right here in the first year, you're negative, right? So you put 30K in, you're not going to have 30K to start. Nowhere near 30K to start or to actually use, right? So maybe in your head, you're like, wait a minute. I have 30K. Maybe I can go invest in my friend's business and we could flip this money in about a year and, and double our return within a year, 30 to 60K. That's not bad at all. I'd rather you do that and then have the 60K and then come back to me and then give me 30 or 20 to help you design a policy. Because now you're securing your profits. You're saying, okay, what you, what you did first was you established a money-making machine. This is one of the biggest problems I think a lot of my clients and viewers face, which is you haven't taken the time to establish a money-making machine. What you've been told by financial advisors, people like myself, is to, hey, get out of debt, build your credit, uh, um, save, right? Save your money or invest your money, but in Wall Street, invest your money outside of you. Invest your money in Bitcoin, invest your money in gold and silver, in oil, and all these different things that's outside of you, which is great. Nothing wrong with that. I think it has to do with timing. I think everything is in timing. Is it the right timing? So if I'm dealing with a client that like I said, four four thousand five hundred a month. Is it the right timing if they're debt free to say, yeah, take that extra thousand and you know put five hundred a month towards you know a whole life policy and take a hundred here and save it in your bank account. Take another hundred, put it in Bitcoin. Another hundred, put in gold and silver. Another two hundred by the S and P five hundred index, and you know pursue your financial independence and retire early movement. I mean, that's cool and all, but uh, did we establish a money-making machine that you build, you personally? And a money-making machine gets built off of your personal gifts, talents, and skills. Yes? Your gifts, talents, and skills. What gifts, what talents, what skills do you bring to the marketplace to increase this. Too many people are focused on this growth. When you need to be doing this, multiply. Because if you multiply, it's so easy to grow. It's so easy to grow because now you have the problem of, oh shoot, I'm making 45 grand a month I'm still living the same lifestyle. Maybe my expenses went up to 10, if that, and I'm cash flowing freaking $30,000 a month. So now you got a new problem. You cash flow 30 grand, right? 30,000 times 12. You're cash flowing 360K a year. You don't know where to allocate the money. That's a better problem to have than to only be dealing with 1,000 and thinking that, you know, with these policies and this and the gold and the Bitcoin and the silver and the yada yada and the Roths and the, this account and the index is going to do anything for me in, in a short period of time. It may. I'm not saying it won't. 
but I'm betting my cards on multiplication. I think I can beat anybody in math if I multiply versus somebody who grows their money at a measly 8 to 10% or lower nowadays, much lower. All right, if you're growing at a steady 4 to 6, 8%, wow, good for you. But why not multiply? 1 plus 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. That's a lot faster to me. You multiply that 30 times, you're at a million in no time. And then you take the free cash flow. Boom. Get the policy. Buy the Bitcoin. Buy the gold. Buy the silver. Now you're diversifying. Buy the index. Buy some real estate. But, but what is the money-making machine? Right? That's the biggest thing. When, when you're figuring out, oh, you know, how do, I, how do I time this infinite banking thing? You know, I'm getting old. Well, if you're getting old, why not build a money-making machine? You've been on planet Earth for 40, 50, 60 years. Why not build a money-making machine first? You have 30, 40, 50 years of experience on planet Earth. There's got to be something that you're an expert on. Right? There's got to be something that you know very well because you've been on planet earth for 30 40 50 60 70 years if you still don't have a money-making machine what's going on good evening denzel what is your opinion of the index participation feature of a whole life policy so the only company that i know that offers this is guardian The only life insurance company I know that has a uh, the index participation, oh my God, I can't spell, index participation, yep, there we go, writer, all right, so IPR for short. So not with, with IULs, there's an index. That, that's really the main difference between a whole life and an IUL, right? You got that index writer. So not, not including those because that is the product. I think your question is more so on the index participation writer feature on a whole life. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if I'm right, the only company I know that, that offers that is, is Guardian. And so the way theirs works is there is a 2% flat fee. Your cap rate is 12.5%. And it follows the index. I believe the S&P 500, if I'm not mistaken. So let's say, let's use my policy. So I'm funding 70K a year. 7K is my premium. I am approaching my third year. So at this point, I got about 130 plus thousand in, in cash value. And then when I dump in the next 70K this year, that number will go up close to the neighborhood of probably 180, 190 probably more. Um, so let's say I wanted to allocate 50K to the, to the index rider. So I would pay 2% flat. All right, so take your 50 grand times it by 2%. So I pay my thousand bucks. That's the fee. Boom. Let's say uh, the S&P goes down, negative. So because there's that 2% flat charge in the beginning, let me make sure I got my numbers right. Yeah. So the Guardian has that 4% guaranteed floor, right? 
that they're going to credit us. So that means I've got 49,000 actually working in the index. But let's say it goes negative, I'll still receive 2% uh, growth that year on the 49. I paid my two from the 50, paid the flat fee, but it did not earn, right? The S&P went negative, but I still participate in the guarantees of that insurance company, which is 4%. But since there was a 2% fee, you minus it, your net internal rate should be 2% on the 49. That's how that works. Let me know if I answer the question. If you are more so talking about the IUL and, and their index, they're, that's standard. You know, every IUL has, a, has an index and there's different options, obviously, within IUL as well. Would you explain how to read the tabular value sheet? Not too good at that. Uh, here's a good resource. If you go to IBC Global, if you type that in, in on, on YouTube, uh, Steve Parisi provides a buttload of videos where he provides really, really good illustrations explaining the, the, the charts, the columns, all that. What I can do is I can take a shot at it. So let's just go left to right, right? So you got the policy year. That just represents how many years I've had the policy. So technically speaking, I've had this policy for um, two years. And I'm about to approach, this is when, this is when the policy got started, All right? 2019, at the age of 23. Based on the current illustration, we're not a mech. It's a good thing, All right? So 2021, my third year, 25, I'm currently 25 years old. Here's my base premium, 7,000 bucks. Here's the guaranteed cash value. That's what that says. End of year dividend, 2,644. So in addition to the seven and the seven, boom, I get nine and I get additional dividend. These are guarantees, okay? Net premium. So premium means total Right, so there's base policy premium, seven grand, but then my total premium is 70K a year. That's how much I'm putting total per year into the policy, right? This column says cash value of all ADDS, that stands for additions. So that 193, 193,474, is the amount of death benefit my cash value obtained me. The two payments of 70K. That's how much uh, I got. Total face amount. Face amounts referring to term, term life. So I got 1.3 million from that. Oh no, sorry. Total face amount of addition, yeah, 1.3, and then to, okay, face amount of one year term, that's the real term, right, of the 1.8. So when I first started the policy, you can see how it's a little bit higher. The, uh, what happens in this specific design is that the um, term rider starts to fall off year to year, and then this column is representing not only what my cash value purchased me, but also like the base premium as well is included. So total face amount of PUAs, additions, right? 900,000. Net cash value. Oh, so I was wrong. I said, I said earlier that my policy would be at like 180, 190. According to this, I'll be at 203 
by the third year. That's pretty cool. So I have a level death benefit for the first seven years. As long as I pay 70K straight, no issues, straightforward, my term will fall off after the seventh year. My death benefit sh would go down if I never pay in another dollar again, but that won't be the case. I'll continue to fund it, All right? So net cash value shows the estimated amount that this money is gonna grow year over year, not guaranteed. Only this number is guaranteed. But these numbers is based off just the seven, right? And these numbers, this column, is based off the other cash, you know, the other monies that went into the PUAs right here. So this and this, we get over here, boom, right? And then, you know, if all I did was just pay in 70K for seven years, it's $490,000, my money would have broke even, right? I break even, and my money grows forever. It's an ever-increasing tax-free personal line of credit that I can tap into. Right, so at 58, I'm at 2 million cash. So would you say I did okay? I think so. Death benefit continues to grow, right? Let's say Denzel passes away at a good old 90, you know? Good old 90 years old. Get 9 million. Maybe I've got, maybe I take out a loan at nine at 90 uh, for $4 million and I throw a big party at 90, right? And then I drop dead. So that would mean that the insurance company would just minus the four from the nine plus any interest and then the, the rest comes back to me, you know? If I live to 100, I'm at 11 million. So for 490 grand, I can end up with $11 million. Not bad, right? Right, well, in, in reality, I, if I kept paying the base, you know, if I kept paying the base, it would um, actually be a lot more in reality. Because this is, this is me putting in 70, and then to keep the policy active, right, to keep the policy open, active, the insurance policy itself becomes sustainable where from my dividends 7,000 goes to the base but then the money still grows in a positive upward direction but if I was to continue personally putting in seven grand this number these numbers would be a lot higher you know they, they would get better with time I don't know if I did a good job in terms of explaining the columns. It can be quite confusing. But like I said, I recommend looking at IBC Global. When you're ready, you know, you talk to an agent, mention my name, Denzel, and more than happy, they're more than happy to help provide value. Why do you think there's a lot of criticism of the 90-10 split of uh, premium slash PUA from many established IBC practitioners, um, it, is a, it is a direct, um, I would say, conflict. It's a direct conflict to the IBC practitioner's pocketbook, right? It's a, it's a direct conflict to that, right? It, it affects their commissions greatly, right? So you just saw my policy. If if I would have went with, um, say, a 50-50 split, right? So 70,000 times 50%, 35,000 bucks goes towards premium. You know, the 35,000 goes towards uh, cash value, right? You still have the term rider, still have PUA fees, sales load charges. 
the commission on that, let's say it's uh, 80%. So I'm gonna make roughly 30 plus thousand dollars on that one policy, as opposed to if the premium was $7,000, right? So 50, 50, 90, 10. If it was $7,000 times that by 80%, it's only five, six thousand bucks, six thousand bucks and some change is is what I would make on my own policy is six thousand as opposed to thirty plus thousand dollars. So, you know, it's a direct conflict to their to their pocketbook. Um, the other um, the other reason why a 90-10 gets criticized quite a bit is the fact that if you don't uh, inform the client, right? So let, let's say you did the same exact policy as me, 70K for seven years, right? As a 90-10 uh, split or 10-90 split. You, either way you say it, we, we, we get what you're saying, right? But let's say after the seventh year, you want to put in another 70K in year eight, in the eight year. Well, with a 90-10 split, you would not be able to do that, right? So that's a drawback that we can identify is, is say, oh, well, if, if I desire to do a policy for long funding, a long funding period, say 30 years, 40 years, then a 90-10 would not work. It would not work. We'd have to go at least, you know, 30, 40 years long um, with, with, with Guardian. We'd have to go up to maybe like 75, 25 split. The advantage to this is that you have the ability to put in 70,000 for more years. So that would mean that if you were to compare somebody that puts in 70K for seven years up against somebody that puts 70K for 30 years, even though the 90-10 is going to have more cash in the early years, eventually the person that puts in 70K for 30 years is going to blow past the 90-10 split because they're putting in more money. So you as a client, you as a potential client, you need to really know how long am I willing to commit these dollars to this type of account? How long am, am I willing to commit? How, how good is my d discipline when it comes to money? Because what you don't want to do is design a 75, 25, or even, you know, as high as a 60, 40, or, you know, I would never go past 60, 40 personally, but, you know, I do see a lot of 50, 50 splits. If you do that and you give them 70 grand, and then in the seventh year, or the eighth year, you're like, I don't want to pay this anymore, or maybe you can't afford it, right? That's a worst case scenario. What's the worst case scenario? You, you can't afford it. You're not able to keep up with the what? Premiums. If you're not able to keep up with the premiums, now it becomes a big bill. Now the strategy is no longer working so well. So what happens? People cancel policies. And then they're left with what? Surrender values. And those have charges. So you really end up in the hole. If you don't keep to your word, so to speak. So that's where the 90-10 kind of comes in and says, look, you don't have to commit to a long funding period and still have high cash value and long-term high cash value. You know, what you are able to do after the seventh year is put in the base plus maybe 3x the, the base premium for the rest of the, the policy's lifespan, you know, and that's cool too. Uh, so those are some, you know, really good things to know as you're really looking into this. I think that everyone should take first chunk of substantial gains or earnings and put them into a trust. 
setting up a back office as trustee, also start future entities in the trust structure. Yeah, so you're saying if I get a big windfall of cash, absolutely, I agree with that. I would definitely, you know, the trust, the will, estate planning, I would start building a team. I'd want a lawyer, a CPA, a business coach, a life coach, a mindset coach. I would start building a team around myself if I do fall into a windfall of cash, for sure. I agree with that. Agent commission is a factor, but not the sole factor. I'm curious about the impact or potential downside long term. Not worried about mech with 90-10 splits. Yeah, so, so he says, I am. I'm curious about the impact or potential downside long term. So yeah, I, I think we identified what would be a drawback on the 90-10 is that you wouldn't be able to continue to max fund your 70K. So if you do 70K for 14 years, I think you could probably still get a 90-10, 70K for 20, maybe 25 and up, you're gonna, you're gonna be required, you need a higher base premium, which is because we need a higher death benefit to be able to put in all that extra money. So how are you supposed to pay off college loans effectively? Okay, I would like a little bit more uh, detail with that question, that'd be great, Evan. So how are you supposed to pay off college loans effectively? Well, effectively, that's a good word, right? Well, you have the options. What are the options to pay off debt? That snowball? Debt avalanche, velocity banking, infinite banking, velocity banking, infinite banking together, debt snowball, velocity banking together, or the one above all, 10x. 10x your income. Build a business, sell something, get a side hustle, make more money. That's really what 10x is, make more money. If you have a PUA but passed away with extra cash value, the insurance company gets the excess, question mark, and if underpaid, family gets the paid difference, question mark. All right, let me see if I understand this. So if you have a paid up addition, well, here's what you need to know, is every time $1 goes into cash value, you'll probably average about $3 an additional death benefit, right? So let's look at my policy again. So let's say I pass away at 73. It says my death benefit is 6.3 million. I have a living benefit of $4 million, right? So if I die with no loans outstanding on the policy, I get 6 million. I put 490,000 in, I get 6.3 million back. I'm not gonna get 6.3 plus 4 million because technically the 4 million is in here, the 6.3. That's where that's at. My cash value is a living benefit, which comes from my death benefit. So that's why every time we take out a loan, a cash value loan, our death benefit gets minus from the cash value. So therefore, our cash value continues to grow as if we never touched it in the first place. All right, so I, I'm not sure if I answered the question there or provided some clarity you can help me with that. I don't know, that's, that's a tougher question. But from my understanding, every time a dollar passes through into cash value, not only is it earning, but it's also buying more death benefit, and that death benefit continues to increase according to the dividends and the performance of the policy. So whether I die with loans or without loans, the only thing I get is a death benefit. The cash value is the death benefit, in a sense, because I get this working dollar today, but then it multiplied itself in the death benefit, and that's why we end up with more than what we ever put in. To the, to the policy. What vehicle would somebody older or with pre-existing conditions just starting uh, use to replicate this system? Maybe they can use somebody who's younger. Maybe they have a younger spouse. Maybe they have children, brother, sister that's younger. So you can use another person to 
establish you know a policy and then you you are the owner they're the insured you're in charge of the cash this is what banks and corporations do on their top executives so you could low-key do that in your household depends on the carrier with gardening we are limited how many years we can stretch that design but mass mutual can stretch that design as long as you want to pay in that is also true comparing but the issue with um even with a, a 90 10 right so now guardian will not allow us to do a 90 10 forever but with mass mutual we can we can get close to a 90 10 it might be like 85 15 depending on your age health and finances but with mass mutual you could do say 70k for a really long period of time like I'm funding a policy, uh, 15K for 31 years, and it is a 90-10, right? So my base premium is 1500 The term rider stays on, though, that whole entire time. So it doesn't drop off. So that cost does go up, but when you look at the net return, although my cost continues to technically increase, in the in the mass mutual uh, design because I I'm holding on to that term the uh, the net underlying internal rate of return continues to you know grow pretty pretty substantially uh, so if you were to compare say a 60 40 against a, a 90 10 same funding period of time and all that stuff I have seen quite a bit where the 90 10 comes out on top and the 60 40 is like right there you know, like, so that's that's the other thing is we're not, it's not a big difference. So if 90 is right here, 60 40 is like right there. And and if you go on that YouTube channel, right, you type in IBC Global, I erased it earlier, but you type in IBC Global Inc., he's done plenty of illustrations where he shows a 90 10 and a 60 40 right up against each other, same funding amount, same age, same health. Uh, same funding period. The only difference is 90, 10, 60, 40. And when, when they're at the end, like 30 years later, 40 years later, the cash value difference is n not so far apart. You know, it's not that far apart. The advantage of the 90, 10 is we get that short term high cash value usage. So that means I can take more money out early on and go do something with it and uh, you know make quite a bit of money correct me if I'm mistaken did you once say that you can skip velocity banking with a line of credit credit card and just use the whole life high cash value policy yes so I guess a, a good example would be somebody that makes a lot of money maybe somebody that has a lot of capital so I would say to, to skip velocity banking using a P-lock or a credit card. Typically, that person has high income, capital, right? And it doesn't mean that they're not going to still use Velocity Bank because they can do both, right? But it it does kind of put Velocity Banking kind of off to the side and they can take a lump sum of a lump sum of cash and start a policy right away. So I have a client that you know dumped about 250k into a policy, right? And then he, you know, borrows out and he's he's essentially moving property debt into his policy. So instead of using a debt tool, line of credit, he's establishing a big policy that he's going to fund over a you know, decent period of time, and he's going to gradually you know, shift, move debt, use, use it to invest and things like that. So I would say those, those people typically will overlook velocity banking, but they don't completely ignore it. They'll still get their credit cards and they'll still get HELOCs and all-in-one loans. They'll still use them because they're great.
or they'll use zero percent you know business loans or one two three percent business loans you go wherever you can save the most amount of interest right let's see uh let's see in many ibc gold videos they state dividends are more favorable to base premium versus pua they have shown example numbers but not the math behind the favorable numbers secret sauce math question mark so that that is a it's a factual statement you know any i would say any infinite banking practitioner whether they're doing 60 40 split or 90 10 or 80 20 or anything in between we all all life insurance agents will agree that the base premium dollars are more favorable in terms of dividends so you you they're stronger than the dividends on the PUAs, the cash, right? So that's a pretty big um, argument that some agents will use to encourage you to have a higher base because you're getting a higher, you know, technically a higher return. But it really boils down to this. Here's how you want to think about it. Let's use the same 70K, right? If I'm putting in 70K a year, my base premium is 7,000, but your base premium was 28K, right? Here's what it really boils down to is the 70K with a 7K base or $28,000 base, they both have the same MEC limit. That's the crazy part. So what you'll see is they'll typically have the same MEC limit because that $28,000 is whole life premium. That purchases you less death benefit. So in this one, this one has more of a term, which is buying more death benefit. Same amount of death benefit, pretty much same similar MEC limit. So. The real question to ask is, well, if it's possible to put in 10x my base and I'm doing 70K and you give me a 28K base premium, what if, oh, my stomach's going crazy. What if I do 70K with, with my base premium at 28,000, but my MEC limit is 280k or more, right? If it's 280,000 or more, that's a hell of a lot better than the 9010. I'm going to go with this one. But if you're giving me the same MEC limit for the same cost, I mean for a higher cost, higher cost, same MEC, that doesn't make sense to me. Because if the whole intent is to put as much money as we possibly can into these things, then why not give me a higher MEC for the for lesser costs, you know, especially with the new rules coming out. That's how it's going to be. The MEC limits are going to be higher for less, you know, costs essentially, right? First year, 17,000 cash value. Second year, 33. Can I borrow 15 the first year and about 30 the second without paying back nothing or not? I don't know how on earth you're going to have 15,000 to borrow if you put 17K. I don't know how that's possible, right? That the math doesn't make sense there. So I'm gonna stop you there, because I've I don't know any policy where I can put in 17k and be able to borrow 15 the first year. I don't see how that is possible. So I'm gonna stop you right there. Even on a 90/10, you ain't gonna have that much cash value available to borrow. You have to remember, your most expensive years are in the beginning years, right? The beginning years. Most expensive years are the beginning years. Could you explain to me the meaning of a Roth IRA? Sure. Pretty simple. It's post-tax. Is that right? Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. It's after tax dollars.
No. Yes. I'm not mistaken. Oh my god, why am I getting confused on here? I think the max... Is it 6500 a year now? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on the on the Roth. I think it's 6500 or 6000 a year that you can contribute. And you can pretty much invest that wherever you want for the most part in the marketplace, stocks, right? Bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, options, whatever you want. And it grows tax-free. Right, you pay taxes now on that 6500 pay taxes now. The money grows tax-free, so you don't get a deduction on the 65 you enter in because you're going to pay tax now on it. Grows tax-free, and then uh, when you get to a certain age, tax-free income. All right. If you get to a certain high income, there's something called the backdoor Roth, and there's a way to, f you know, play around with that. And Zell, I don't have any credit card debt. I just have my mortgage. Would it make sense to utilize my HELOC to pay off my mortgage? Probably. We have to look at the numbers. We have to look at the numbers, right? So let's say you got a HELOC at 6%, and your mortgage is at 2.2% or it's at 2.7 or it's at 3 it might not make sense to do velocity banking on that it might not it might not make sense to try and pay that off early at all because if your mortgage rate is less than 3% and your property is appreciating appreciating at 3% you might want to ask yourself, do I really want to pay this off? Do I really want to allocate my cash flow to pay that off? Or can I take that cash flow and earn a higher rate somewhere else or invest in my business or 10x or acquire another property or turn that property into an asset where it pays me cash flow? Maybe I rent it out. So there's a lot of things to consider. Currently have a 15-year fix with a 1.75 rate. I do. He says, I do want to pay off my mortgage sooner. Okay, well, it's up to you. If you want to pay it off, cool, do it. But 1.75, if your HELOC is like four points higher, it might not make sense. That's where we say, okay, we ran the numbers. Velocity banking doesn't make sense. Well, you're left with that snowball. Should I pay my mortgage down to get a HELOC before I start an IBC policy if my monthly cash flow is under 1,000 bucks? Probably, probably. Depends. You know, got to look at your numbers. You got to see what direction do I want to go in. How, how valuable am I, am I propping up IBC, right? How valuable am I really, you know, uh, mapping it out on the timeline? If I got under a thousand bucks in cash flow per month, yeah, let's do some velocity banking. Maybe we, uh, how long is it going to take me to pay off that mortgage? Should I pay off that mortgage? Should I even look at the mortgage? If, if that's the only debt I have left, I did velocity banking, wiped out all the other stuff, right? We wiped out all the other debts. And now we're just left with um, your mortgage, maybe student loans. Maybe now's the time to create a 10x strategy, create another stream of income. And you want to do the math. If it takes you the same amount of time to 10x, to get debt free. If it takes you five years to get debt free, it takes you five years to 10x, which would you rather do? Because you have to understand if you 10x in five years or less, you could just write a check, pay off the whole mortgage, right? So you both got the same goal. The difference is the person that just did debt snowball or velocity banking is debt free and broke. They have to start the engine. They now have to invest. Whereas the other person took the time to 10x, managed their debt, got to the end line, wrote a check, paid off in full, and have money to splurge and keep reinvesting in themselves. So there's a lot to look at. Can you talk about why IUL would be a better infinite banking tool than a whole life insurance? I heard some advisors say only whole life. 
and not IUL. I would visit, uh, I would take a look at Oregon Cashflow Pro. Okay, he was in the house earlier, probably still is. Um, I take a look at his material. He provides, you know, pretty transparent information. I would say whole life is probably going to give you higher cash value in the beginning. IUL is, is more hypothetical. Uh, you're not getting the guarantees that maybe the whole life provides. Okay. So with the IUL, it's, you're, you're now flirting with investing because your money's going in the index. It can grow, it can lose, it can go up, it can go down. So the way I've been pitched IUL and explained IUL to me is more of a retirement strategy. So the idea that you're going to have more money than a whole life at retirement age, right? So it's kind of pitched that way in that sense. 15K out of 17K is 88%. Garden, you can get 87, so it could be close. Uh, yeah, that's good. I appreciate that. So Argon saying, you know, could maybe be done, but again, I, I just don't like personally. I don't like to borrow the max amount of cash in in the first year. There is a way to get to 90% available to borrow from Guardian. Also, I can share with you some time. I believe it. I just. I just don't go anywhere near 90% leverage on my uh, policy because there's a component of saving also in infinite banking that we kind of want to stick with. I think a lot of us, and I, I probably made the same mistake is, you know, infinite banking, the concept, it, it really shouldn't be intertwined with investing. I think the main idea is safe, guaranteed growth that's like the main idea of the concept safe guaranteed growth recapture costs recapture interest savings is the biggest key behind it and then it allows you to, to redeploy that cash into an investment outside of the policy earning money in two different um, locations so but there's so many strategies on the internet where, yeah, you know, infinite banking, and I've done it myself, you know, I pull it, you know, could be used as a way to invest your dollars where you, you send the money to it first, then you borrow it out and you go use it. That's, that's fine and dandy. But you really need to take the time, just sit down with someone Take a friend, take a partner, evaluate these people, evaluate myself, people on the internet that I recommend. Just look at all the options. You come to a decision. I don't think you will go wrong if you know this right here, your four major numbers. You can't go wrong if you know your four major numbers. So say for example, you did get a 60-40 split policy, right? With a uh, whole life. And then you come across someone like myself that does 90-10. Well, if you knew your numbers, you got your 60-40 whole life, great. Keep it. Keep funding it. Maybe you had it for seven years. It's well established. You're well past the cost. Great. Cool. Keep funding it. If you come to me, I'm going to say, look, let's build that and if you want to start a second policy, okay, maybe you do a 90-10. And then after coming across me, then you come across IUL. And so you're like, oh, shoot, I want to try that. I want to try IUL. I say, okay, well, how do we keep increasing this income? And then you can feed into the IUL. And then you're like, oh, shoot, what's this premium financing thing? The bank can fund my own policy? Okay, hey, how do we keep increasing income? Maybe you get a premium financing policy. I've seen people do it all where they, they get them all because I guess you won't know until you try, right? In that sense, I will say me personally, I, I dwell right here for right now. I got two whole life policies, have a Roth, have a Robinhood account, Fidelity. I do the stocks, 
I do the indexes by the S&P. I'm more interested in real estate, putting my money in real estate. Okay. I buy the gold, I buy the silver, the Bitcoin, the Ethereum, the stable coins, the Cardano, the altcoins. I'm just essentially, the more I focus on this, building more income, the more financial products I can purchase and leverage and use. So the issue never becomes the product, really. The major issue is this, the money. Do I have the money to afford it? Right? So that's why people with such little cash flow, if you've got little cash flow, thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, three thousand bucks, if that's the only money you got, that's why you're spending so much time trying to say, oh, is this better? Is this better? Is that better? Is this better? Is that better? Is this better? Is that better? Is that better? Is this better? Is that better? You spend all that time trying to find the best product. But your biggest issue was this. You don't have enough money. So you're trying to get the most right out of those dollars because if you lose it, you're in deep you know what. And we don't want to be in deep you know what. So that's why I like when I talk to my clients and I, I just meet them where they're at. I'm like, look, here's where I want to go. I understand that you don't have the knowledge yet or you don't have the mental capacity to handle this yet. I get it. But at some point, we cannot just make sense of cash flowing a thousand bucks forever, two thousand bucks forever, three thousand bucks forever, and, and, and save and invest those dollars outside of ourselves for 40 years and hope and pray that these financial instruments are gonna provide us financial freedom. I don't think we should look at it that way. I think we should look at um, how can I bring value into the marketplace and get paid at an exponential rate and have more money to put into the financial instruments and I basically guarantee financial freedom in that sense. So those are my thoughts. Zan needs your help. Do you provide personal consultations? So thank you for asking that. So yes, I do offer personal financial consulting only in the Velocity Banking Manifesto. So you have to join my program first, okay? So I have three options. I have a monthly option, $19.99 a month, $19.99 a month. I've got an annual option, $147 a year. I've got a lifetime option, $547, one time. It comes with one hour session with me, one-on-one. -on -one. And then with all the options, the monthly, the annual, the lifetime, I have something called performance-based consulting, performance-based coaching, performance-based coaching. Mess the number of words there. So with that, you have to go through my course, watch the videos, and you will earn time with me one-on-one, -on -one, which you can redeem at a later time, okay? So if you're looking for an instant conversation one-on-one -on -one, right away the lifetime option is going to be better although you'll get a message from me where i say i highly recommend that you watch my videos go through the course get your numbers in line get your debt tool learn the fundamentals so that i'm not teaching you the same stuff that i share in my videos we go right into the strategy right consulting is for strategy Right? I don't want to really coach you on discipline and why this and why that and why this and why that. I don't really want to do all that. I want to strategize numbers in one hour or less. Here are your numbers. This is what you're doing. Here's where you got to make the chunk. Here's where we make our next chunk. Here's the money that we got to redirect. Like it's straight to the point. That's how I like to personally operate. I will leave you with that. I left out some comments, so forgive me, but we're going to close it out here. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Click the links in the description below so you can see all the different um, services, the different options. 
in terms of working with me, working with my partners and affiliates, um, and then also joining my email newsletter so you stay up to date with all the events that I have going on, getting access into my private Facebook group so that you can ask more questions over there. I have a lot of my clients and loyal subscribers that give value in, in, uh, in the comment section where people post their numbers, their questions, very detailed. And not just myself, but there's a whole community of people that are giving value. So that's pretty cool. And I will leave you with that. Talk soon.